Welcome to another part of the satellite reception series. In the last two videos I covered APT and LRPT, so today I want to dedicate the video to a specific antenna type that has become notoriously associated with the two mentioned radio protocols, but also serves as a decent antenna for satellite reception at any other frequency. I am of course talking about the V-Dipole antenna. While I did mention it in passing in the previous videos and even shown some very exciting footage of it receiving an APT broadcast, now I want to take a closer look at its construction, how it actually differs from a normal dipole, what are its benefits and drawbacks and also present an example of how it can be constructed. First let's talk about what a dipole antenna is. Arguably this is one of the simplest forms of an antenna as it consists of only two conductors called the legs, one connected to the center pin of a coaxial cable while the other is connected to its outer shield. Both legs have the same length, which is selected to be one quarter of the desired operating wavelength, so the total length of the dipole is double that. This is also where the name half-wave dipole comes from. The straight shape of a dipole antenna means that it's going to best receive signals coming from sources laying at an imaginary line that is perpendicular to the dipole itself, which then also results in two blind spots for any signal sources in line with the dipole's tips. You can kind of visualize this by looking at the dipole antenna from different angles and watching how much of the actual antenna you can see at any given time. Despite this, dipoles are usually classified as omnidirectional antennas, as when they are used for the reception of vertically polarized terrestrial signals, such as broadcast radio stations, these blind spots, more appropriately referred to as nulls, are aimed up into space and down into the ground, where radio stations generally don't tend to be. This of course isn't the case with satellites, so if a dipole antenna like this is to be used for receiving signals from space, you have to either accept a potential loss of signal when a satellite gets directly above it, or we can do the next best thing. Putting a dipole antenna in a horizontal orientation, or parallel with the ground, will align its nulls with the horizon, where we generally wouldn't be receiving many signals from the satellites anyway due to the low elevation and obstacles in the radio signals path. Furthermore, in case of weather satellites that are all in pretty much the same polar orbits, we can put the nulls directly east and west, where they will cause the least amount of damage to our received signal. The dipole can be even further optimized for more or less omnidirectional reception of satellites. And this is where we finally get to the V part. By introducing a 120 degree angle to the two legs of the dipole, the nulls are partially mitigated, and the antenna's receiving performance is essentially better distributed across the entire sky. This angle also brings down the impedance of the dipole closer to 50 ohms, which in theory helps its performance, but in practice has negligible effects, especially when cheaper TV coaxial cable is used, which it safely can be. The V-shape is placed flat with respect to the ground, so the bent legs of the dipole protrude towards the horizon instead of up or down. That way the antenna isn't at all parallel to the coaxial cable that connects to it from the bottom, which is something you generally want to avoid, as it could affect the performance in unexpected and usually unwanted ways. And that's pretty much all the theory behind the V-dipole antenna. Because of its dead simple construction, there are countless ways you can build this antenna on your own, and chances are you already have all the material needed, or that it is all available in any nearby hardware store. It will be completely up to your own imagination to realize this antenna, but there are still some design principles that should be followed. The first and arguably most important one is the length of the dipole's legs, as that will directly influence the radio frequencies it will be able to receive signals at. As mentioned at the beginning, the length of a dipole leg is selected to be one quarter of the wavelength you want it to operate at. The wavelength at 137.5 MHz, which is the center of the VHF weather satellite band, is 218 cm, with one quarter being 54.5 cm. While using this length will probably be fine, in practice the legs should actually be slightly shorter to compensate for some physical properties of the conductor material being used. Now here, I'm going to be honest, I couldn't find a straight answer as to how much shorter the legs actually should be. I found an article from DenKB6NU, which I'm going to link in the description if you want to read a bit about this. And I will also link to an article by Adam9A4QB, which talks about a V-dipole antenna for weather satellites specifically, and also includes a nice schematic of one. Note that both of them use slightly different formulas to calculate the dipole's length which in the case of 137.5 MHz would put it anywhere between 51.8 and 53.4 cm. Dan mentions that the real ideal length is going to be influenced by the antenna's installation, so it's not really possible to give one exact perfect value. However, we are still talking about only around a 5% variation in the length, and chances are that you won't spot a performance difference when the antenna is only used for receiving, especially in the case of relatively strong signals, which APT and LRPT definitely are. With all this said, I would probably just recommend following Adam's schematic if your intention is receiving weather satellites, as it was specifically made for this use case. If you are building a V-dipole antenna for a different frequency, just keep the leg length slightly below a quarter wavelength. 
The legs can be made out of just about any conductive material, but something like brass or copper is probably the best choice, as they don't rust and can be soldered to if that's how you're going to be connecting to the coaxial cable. Aluminium would probably also work if you're going to be using some other mechanical connection. Looking at my poor example of a Vida antenna, you can see I used cheap brass welding rods for the legs, which are readily available at any hardware store, and connected them to the coaxial cable through an ordinary electrical terminal block. Because these blocks achieve electrical contact by tightening screws into the conductors, I felt flat spots into the ends of the brass rods so the screws lock them in place and prevent them from rotating and loosening over time. To further improve the rigidity of the V-shape, I put two additional blocks on the wooden slab that holds the 120 degree angle and also take the load of the block that's in charge of connecting the coax. In this case, I simply jammed the two conductors from the cable into the other side of the block and tightened it. I also added a 100 kilo ohm resistor between the two conductors, which in theory should help with electrostatic discharge protection of whatever is connecting to the antenna. This is what the dipole antenna from RTL-SDR also did, although, according to the RTL-SDR block, the newer models of their dipoles no longer have these resistors, with the ESD protection inside the SDR being sufficient, so it's up to you whether you want to include it or not. Not having it may improve the dipole's reception a little bit. You also probably have better materials and building techniques available. For example, making the antenna body out of plastic or aluminium to get a sturdier design. So it really mainly depends on your creativity and how much money and time you want to invest into making it. If you are going to be using any conductive materials to construct the antenna body, make sure the dipole legs are well isolated from it and try to minimize the amount of conductive material running parallel to them. The last thing about the build itself I want to mention is the coaxial cable. Once again, I went the cheapest route possible and just used a piece of standard off-the-shelf 75 ohm TV coax. The impedance of most SDRs and all amateur radio equipment in general is around 50 ohm, however, similar to the dipole leg length discrepancy, the small impedance mismatch here doesn't really matter with the receive only antenna. If you are chasing a theoretically perfect performance, then a DIY antenna probably isn't the best choice anyway, unless you have the measuring and test equipment to back it up. What does matter though is how you are going to connect the coax to your SDR. In the spirit of using cheap and readily available components, I simply terminated the coax with a screw on F connector. This does however mean that I have to use an adapter to connect it to the SMA port on the SDR, and depending on where you live, getting an adapter like that may actually be the biggest hassle in the entire antenna building process, so it is up to you whether you should consider a different cable and connector combination. Now comes the antenna placement. Common sense would suggest that putting the antenna at the highest spot possible would logically result in the best reception, but unfortunately the world of radio waves rarely follows common sense. In fact, sometimes putting the antenna purposefully lower to the ground can significantly improve its performance. The ground itself is going to basically become a part of your antenna. As a rule of thumb, in case of a V-dipole, the higher above ground you place it, the better its reception will be at lower elevations, which basically just means longer reach of the antenna and longer images in case of APT and LRPT, but putting it higher will also destabilize its radiation pattern. If you have the option to put the antenna high on top of a building or a pole, then the distance may just be far enough for these negative effects to be minimal. However, if like me you are planning on using the antenna just a few meters above ground, you may want to experiment with placing it at different heights and seeing how it affects your performance. A lot of this depends on trial and error, as even unpredictable things such as your local soil composition and moisture can have an effect on your antenna. If you experience seemingly random signal losses, even when the satellite is high above the horizon with nothing obstructing the signal's path, then you probably just have to put the antenna at a different height above the ground. For now I'm just going to show you examples of real-world V-dipole antennas realized by other members of the satellite reception community. You can see different construction methods as well as differing heights at which the antennas are placed. In some cases you will also spot what looks like a second identical V-dipole antenna positioned below the first one. This is called a reflector. On its own the second V is not electrically connected to the main one above it, but placing it at a specific distance below it has the potential to further optimize the radiation pattern by essentially redirecting more of the antenna's gain upwards instead of wasting it below it. It can also make the antenna's performance more consistent and less influenced by the ground. While I don't have any usable photos of it, I did originally use a setup with a reflector like that as well. And in my case, the distance between the V-dipole and the reflector was around one quarter wavelength. The length of the reflector's legs was the same as the dipoles, although it probably should be slightly longer, similarly to reflectors in Yagi antennas. Even if you build the V-dipole in its simplest form, without a reflector, I believe you will get surprisingly decent performance. 
There are of course other antenna options that in theory are better suited for the task of receiving satellites, such as the QFH or turnstile antennas that have become strongly associated with APT and LRPT receivers, but I would actually recommend against building these, at least until you can get some good results with the V-Dipole. The V-Dipole does come with some inherent signal losses given by its design that will prevent it from achieving a theoretically perfect performance. One is the fact that the V-Dipole antenna is linearly polarized, while most satellites transmit their signals circularly polarized. The other is the dipole's radiation pattern being identical both above and below it, assuming no reflector is used and ignoring effects of the ground, which essentially results in a big part of the antenna's performance being wasted. But all of the V-Dipole's drawbacks are, at least in my opinion, well compensated for by its extremely simple construction and great tolerance to design imperfections. I'm sure some of you do have the tools and skills that are needed to construct a really well-performing QFH antenna, but it is simply not the case for most people. Remember on the logarithmic decibel scale, losing even a half of the signal power translates into losing just 3 decibels, with the signals from weather satellites usually received at a strength of at least a few dozen decibels. Too often I see newcomers being told to build something complex and far stricter in terms of build quality, like a QFH, turnstile or a DCA, and while usually they do end up with an antenna that performs good enough, at that point you could just build a V-Dipole to get the same results at a fraction of the effort and cost. And if you do eventually decide to take on one of the more advanced antenna projects, you can use your existing V-Dipole as a reference. Or you know, you can just build a directional Yagi antenna, manually track the satellites as they fly by and completely overshadow the performance of any V-Dipole QFH or other omnidirectional antenna. But even then, having a V-Dipole as your starting point will immediately tell you if your brand new antenna is performing better as it should. And that about does it for this video. Looking back, I probably should have made this before the videos about APT and LRPT, but what's done is done and I suppose it's better late than never. I already have some topics for future videos in this series selected, but seeing how long it took me just to make this one, who knows when those will come out. So in the meantime, if you have any questions about this topic or suggestions for different future topics you would like to see covered, feel free to let me know. Like, share, subscribe, all of that. Follow me on Twitter so you too can have photos of your antenna stolen in my future videos. And for now, I thank you for watching and I hope you'll join me next time.